to introduce us, Megan? Yes, tonight we have Matt Baldwin and Lonnie Bartelt who are going to speak with us about the Brotherton Tribe in the 1980s. Um, do we want to go around introducing ourselves real quick first? Sure. Okay, I'm Megan and I am Brotherton through the Narragansett line, Mary Elizabeth Hammer. And I have been involved with the tribe since I started working on the newsletter with my cousin, Tim Vanderhoff. And I've also been involved with the Envision Committee and the Grants Committee. And I live in Georgia with my husband and two kids. Seth? Uh, Seth Nelson, I'm brother Tim through Mohegan, uh, Lucinda Bruchel. Uh, my grandma was on council way back when and grew up kind of learning about things through her and, and being involved when I could on trips back to Wisconsin and such and I do the news now and uh, helped on some past grant stuff and just uh, excited to have these things and uh, hopefully we can get a few more people joining tonight uh, and out here in Washington State. Gabriel? Hello, I'm Gabriel Casfidel, um, non-tribal, non-descent, but uh, um, um, <laughs> Getting tangled for years via music, shape note singing, hymnody histories, and uh, um, yeah, good enough. Okay, and that was Jane Forchette, did you say? Orchard. You may have remembered me more as Jane Wisniewski before my remarriage uh, in the 80s and 90s. I was a council member, worked on the newsletter and also worked with Pete Wilson on the cemeteries. So, and my uh, lineage is Johnson Fowler. So you must be in Wisconsin. I'm in Clintonville, Wisconsin. Yes, I'm closer to actually to Gresham, Stockbridge, Muncie, and the Menominee. Ah, okay. Yes, I'm Mark Baldwin. Um, I've been involved with Brotherton stuff since 1980. Um, my line is uh, Wiggins and Paul, and we go back to Christiana Ockham. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, Brotherton lines uh, within that. Um, I started the, the Brotherton Mis Messenger, the newsletter, been on council, been vice chair, um, been on the grants committee, and um, on Brotherton Forward now. So, um, and that's me. Okay. <laughs> and now, Miss Lonnie. Hi, everybody. Um, I've been involved with the tribe since about 1980. I was the recording secretary for the tribe. I was a research paraprofessional under our first grant. And I've been the family genealogist for about, oh, well, 38 years. So uh, our lines are uh, Simeon and Sabrina Welch Shelley, so it's Mohegan, Pequot, and Nanticoke Indian. All right. Well, I'd like to start out just by acknowledging tribal members who were very active in the 1980s but have passed on. Uh, the group in Gresham included Anna Jacobs, Curly Robinson, Marine Rob Ma Marie Robinson, Madeline Crow, Ray Hashberger, and Gordon Burr. Uh, folks in Southern California were Harry and Rose Towsey, Phil and Olivia Towsey, Renona Elson, Phyllis Matern, Maynard and Blanche Thompson, Leo Towsey, Vivian Haas, Irma and Boots Sampson, and Ted Stephenson. Um, are there any others that I should be mentioning, Lonnie? No, you got the same list I have. Okay. Were you wasn't involved back then? Yes. Um, I was further on my list, I have other Brothertons that didn't, didn't li live in the state of Wisconsin, okay. and those were uh, Will and Rudy Ottery. Um, there were academics who provided support, who I believe most of them are still with us. Bob Goff, John Turchineski, Jack Campisi, and Nancy Lurie. And other Brothertons that were active during the 1980s were Phyllis Frederick, Lonnie Bartelt, Dave Hankwitz, Ed Welsh, Joan, Vald Joan Valdevogel. And any others uh, I should be mentioning, Lonnie? Well, 
No, that sounds pretty good to me. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge them and uh, the contributions that they've made. Um, Lonnie and I are just two individuals that uh, played a part, but it was a much uh, bigger group of people that uh, gave life and blood to uh, the cause. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And I'd also like to acknowledge that Rudy Adery was the first tribal genealogist because um, I'm reading a lot of these books and I'm not seeing Rudy acknowledged as our tribal genealogist, and she was. Do you know what right. she was? She was, wor she was okay. working on her own book before uh, the 1980s, so um, she was doing her family genealogy and other genealogy before that, so I don't know exactly when she started. Yeah, I want to say was it. I want to say it was the early 80s, and uh, and the other misconception that I'm seeing in some of these books is that she was Brotherton, and it was not her that was Brotherton, it was her, her husband, Will, right. who was June, June Easel's brother. Right. Okay. Um, I wanted to approach this by how I first got uh, involved originally, and I was in college at the time, and in 1978, I was trying to get a Indian scholarship to help with my um, schooling. And so I uh, tried going through the BIA and got nowhere. And so I approached uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson for assistance, and he contacted um, the acting director of the Office of Indian Education and um, the guy there was uh, Bob Fos Don Fosdick. And in his original reply, he stated that the Brothertons were not federally recognized and therefore not receiving any bureau services. And then I have a quote from him. While there has been some misunderstanding on this matter between the agency and the Minneapolis office, the final determination is that they are federally recognized and entitled to bureau services. They urged me to follow normal application procedures in Ashland, Wisconsin for scholarship this fall. Well, that was a temporary um, ruling. And um, what I did is I did apply and I did get a scholarship for a semester. And then after that semester, they determined or they made the determination I was the wrong Mark Allen Baldwin. There is another Mark Allen Baldwin in the Brothertown tribe, and he had more Indian blood than I did. So um, I was then not eligible to receive um, the scholarship, and so that was discontinued. Um, an interesting thing to note is I got a subsequent letter um, in March of 1980 where. Uh, yeah. John Geary is saying that the previous letter was in error, yeah. that the Brotherton community is not federally recognized, but certain Brothertown community members who are one half or more Indian blood may have been, been determined to be eligible for service from the Bureau due to their status as Indians, but not based on any determination of el eligibility as members of a recognized tribe. They attached a list of tribes that are recognized. Uh, they said the Brotherton roles were available at the Ashland Great Lakes Agency. And um, they said that if there was an authorized person, they could, could uh, request those roles to be uh, deli not delivered, but given to them. Um, and I provided them a list of Brotherton names that I had. And they said that they would contact the Brothertons and let them know how to petition for federal acknowledgement. Um, now, this is not to say that this is the only way this started, because my understanding is that Anna Jacobs began on her own, um, probably before this, uh, trying to start uh, the effort to uh, petition for acknowledgement. I think it was either a Gordon Burr or Ray Hashberger that had encouraged her to do that. Uh, so 
the group in Gresham had started, uh, I believe, even earlier than this and was working on the process. Um, I'm sorry? Where were you, Gondolak? No, this was up in Gresham. Okay, so you wrote your letter in Gresham? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm not getting. Did you write your letter from Gresham or where were you? Were no, you I lived, I lived in um, Sheboygan at the time and I was attending school in UW-La Crosse. Um, so, Lonnie, did you, did you, were you able to attend any of the meetings in Gresham? Uh, I think a few of them I did, yeah. And do you know, do you remember anybody else that was like in attendance at that time besides Anna Jacobs and Harry mm -hmm. Towsey and Phil Towsey and... No, not really. I remember. I, I had remember. attended one meeting. This is Jean. I had attended a meeting in Gresham, mm -hmm. and that was where June Easold, uh, the Thompsons, Maynard, and, and Blanche. Um, Blanche. Yes, she was there. And uh, I still have my letters from them that they would help me find my family line. I was trying to do that for my mother because everything had been so well hidden. Their family had all relocated up into the um, Unity, Abbotsford, Colby area. Um, also present at that meeting was the Sampsons, Irma and Boots. And so uh, then they referred me to go to the Stockbridge Library and get their books and material, and they helped me also. So that was in the very um, early 80s, about 84. What line were you from that, that, that you ended up uh, up in the Unity area? Johnson Fowler. Oh, okay. And so most Johnsons are there, and my uh, lineage was then from a, it went into the Girl line, G-I-E-R-L, and there are a lot of those. My mother's married name was Wiedemann, Wiedemann, and so that's how most of my family is um, enrolled, a great number, if anyone sees the enrollment records or works on those. Yeah, I've come, to, I've come to find out that, that there was a whole group of Brothertons, including the Johnsons and the Shelleys, that went up yeah. to, uh, in the, about, about 1878, went up to the Unity area, and then some of the Shelleys, like John Shelley, went on to Minnesota, and I think some of the other, other tribal members, uh, and then some of them, like um, or David Shelley, I mean, and then John Shelley actually went on to the state of Washington. But I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that it might have had something to do with the Homestead Act. Sure. Uh, what makes it difficult is that uh, on the Johnson line, it was all matrical, uh, the female. Yes. They were all the female line. So that's, you know, how it kind of gets lost, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I know um, that the Gresham group they they were met they met with great determination and they worked hard on uh, fighting this ted stephenson was really a big push for it so okay um getting back to the 1981 in september there was a uh historical committee workshop at Nicolay College yeah, that was put on by um, Bob Goff and John Turchineski and I think a couple of other people and several Brothertons attended to learn how to do the historical research that would be ne needed to collect information for the acknowledgement petition. So I remember I attended that, um, my mother attended that, um, probably I think Dave Hankwitz was there, um, Lonnie, were you there? I don't think so. I remember going to a a meeting with June and Carl down in Illinois about the about the process of getting federal re recognition. And I don't want to go into that already stupid one. Okay. 
Uh, in October of, of 81, I wrote a letter to Ed Welsh, who is in Arizona, um, who had been, I believe, on the commission that established the federal acknowledgement uh, process. Uh, he's an attorney and um, he uh, was asked to ask him about uh, writing some articles for the newsletter and uh, told him like the first one was coming out on November 10th, 1981. Um, so I just wanted to um, make, do some outreach to him to make sure that he was uh, aware of what we were doing. Um, I think I skipped it, but um, I had approached the council, I believe in September of that year to get the permission to start up a newsletter, which was the Brotherton Messenger. And that was approved. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the first newsletter went out in November 1981. Um, in February of 82, Nonprofit Incorporation papers were signed. I was appointed to a council seat and my sister Barb was appointed as secretary treasurer until the May election. I was also selected chair of the nominating committee along with Leo Tausey and Marlena Bischoff. Um, our slate of candidates was, it was Phyllis Frederick, um, it was uh, Renona Elson, it was June Isold as chair, and I believe uh, Dave Hankwitz and myself were also nominated. And I can't tell you exactly who was elected because I don't have that in my notes, but um, those are the people that were nominated. Um, in 1982, um, it was uh, pointed out that that was the year of our 150th anniversary in the state of Wisconsin. And so um, folks were interested in holding some sort of ceremony. And this was really the brainchild of Bob Goff. Um, uh, I met with them in February of that year. Um, with uh, Phil and Chris, or Olivia Towsey and Bob Goff to, to suggest um, how we might go about doing that. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the governor was at the presentation and um, have uh, try and get some Calumet County representative to introduce legislation re uh, recognizing the contributions of Brotherton Indians um, in the past 150, uh, two years, 150 years. Um, so we did get a grant in order to do that from the Wisconsin Humani Humanities Committee and uh, we created a traveling exhibit um, that traveled the state for a year and it was also um, uh, displayed at the ceremony, I believe it was in July of 2000, uh, 1982. And here are just some photos of, I know that black and white and they're not very good, but this is a crowd shot. Uh, this is shot of, I believe it's Olivia. No, no, that's Phil Towsey. Little higher uh, toward the lens. Yes, yeah, better, thank you. Phil Towsey. Um, this was, I can't see. Harry Towsey. Yep. With his whole headdress on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this are a couple of photos of the traveling exhibit that were on display in the rotunda. Wow. Of the Capitol. Yep. Yes. Cool. And then throughout that year, Gabriel, it also was displayed down at the Milwaukee Museum, downtown Milwaukee. Good for you guys. And this was Gervais Hefner, 
who was Calumet County supervisor or the state legislator, I believe. And um, he's the one that sponsored the um, legislative commemoration um, legislation. And his grandfather or great grandfather was in the Civil War and he was shot off of a horse and he was rescued by none other than a Brotherton Indian. So that was written into the uh, proclamation that he was grateful to the Brotherton Indians for saving his great grandfather. Wow. Um, this is a picture with uh, Phyllis Frederick and Governor Lee Dreyfus. And I'm not sure if that's uh, Chairman Paulus or whether this is the Menominee Chairman, but it was one of them um, in front of the exhibit. Is this Phyllis Frederick? Is this uh, Bill and Chris's daughter? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. And then um, here was um, Governor Dreyfus um, making presentation. And then this is um, Dreyfus along with um, June Easold up at the lectern. So I have maybe about 50 more photos, but I, I just wanted to give you a little taste of um, the event. It was a very positive thing. We had, um, I think, most recognized tribes in Wisconsin sent a representative and addressed the, the crowd. Um, and as we mentioned, the uh, exhibit uh, traveled the state for an, another year. Um, so uh, just wanted to make sure that you all knew about that. Um, I know some of you had some knowledge of it, but um, I'm presenting a little bit more. Matt, uh, where is that? Where are the pieces of the exhibit now? Well, they were taken apart. And uh, the um, photographs are supposed to be in the tribal, tribal archives, um, which are now, I believe, in the BINC, the Brothertown Indian Community Center. Is that what it's called in Fond du Lac? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you mean by archive, do you mean like what had been at uh, Marion College? Yes. Um, yeah, multiple people when I was out there in summer said their own hands carried everything out of there and into the museum room at the Bidden CC. So it's all there now. Nothing is left at Marion. Yeah, and I have pictures of when we actually put it in Marion College. Oh, cool. <laughs> there is a black briefcase in the museum at the Center in Fond du Lac that I donated to the tribe uh, about three years ago. It has pictures of us doing a lot of different activities in the 80s. We have, I have pictures of council meetings and general meetings and putting the first grant together on the floor with like 40 pages, everybody walking around putting a page down. You had page number one, I had page number two, and we all went around this room and put all these pages down and made all these copies. So I have a lot of pictures that uh, I donated to the tribe. And Lonnie, I wanted to point this out to you in March, a letter dated March 2, 1982. I got a letter from Olivia Towsey in which she mentions that when she spoke with Jack H. at the genealogy desk at the Wisconsin Historical Society, he gave her the name of a Brotherton. And in quotes, well, when I wrote to the lady, and sent her a newsletter and forms to fill out. A big envelope in the return mail came with all kinds of information, plus the fact that these people are all descendants of the Shelley and are about 290 some Brotherton. What a find. I hope they are mostly in Wisconsin. She was delighted as, delighted as we were. I wrote June a note, call her to see if it was possible that she can come down to the next meeting. And I'm not sure, did um, June give you a ride down to a meeting? Yep. Or I know she used to do that. Yep, June and Carl, yep. They could, when they were still in Milwaukee, they would pick me up every month and bring me up to the meetings. And then once they moved uh, up north after June retired, 
then I would take the, and, and at that point I was the secretary and the research fair professional, I would take the, the trailways bus from Milwaukee up to Fond du Lac and June and Carl would come over and pick me up and take me over to the office and we'd work on research materials throughout the day on Friday and then Saturday we'd have the tribal council meeting in the morning and then the tribal general meeting in the afternoon and then June and Carl would take me back to to the bus station and drop me off and I would take the bus back to Milwaukee. <laughs> I did that for many years. <laughs> and this this one's for Seth. Um, on March 15th, 1982, I got a letter from Phyllis Frederick where she mentions that Renona Elson was chosen to attend a tribal archives workshop at UW Stevens Point and noticed that Renona was also working with Rudy Ottery on genealogy. Very cool. <laughs> And um, in March of 82, um, I went along with Harry Towsey and Marie Robinson uh, to a meeting of Great Lakes Intertribal Council. Um, it was because we wanted to be get, uh, we wanted to become associate members of the council. And um, apparently there were, there was some disagreement among the members. And so we wanted to come and make a, make a presentation. And at that point we were introduced by Rick St. Germain and John Paulus the, of the Oneida introduced himself and said he was willing to help us. Um, so that, uh, we were disappointed by that because we wanted them to uh, accept us, but they said they would have to wait until we were federally recognized before they would accept us into uh, Great Lakes Standard Tribal Council. Um, okay, I think I already talked about that. Yeah, oh, um, as far as um, the election in 82, I was right. Uh, the nominating committee uh, nominated Phyllis Frederick, Dave Hankwitz, me, and Renona Elson as um, uh, candidates. Nominated from the floor were Jim Schneider, Marie Robinson, Curly Robinson, Joe Dodlinger, and Lonnie Bartelt. June Isold was nominated as the chair. Uh, in June of that year, I got a letter from Lonnie saying she was glad that she wasn't elected to the council because she wants to continue to do research with Rudy and help with genealogy. And um, do you remember you described a free source that you got 500 copies of the three-page tribal enrollment forms photocopied for? Do you remember what you bartered for that? No, I don't. <laughs> I really don't. I, I don't believe this. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 got, you got 500 copies of the um, enrollment form for a, a, a bottle of brandy that you gave to your source. Okay. <laughs> I had no idea who the source was. <laughs> but it was worth it, I guess. I have a lot of family members. And I was the one working with, with Rudy Addery trying to get everybody in my family enrolled. And I'm still doing that with the Red Files. So I managed to get about eight cousins enrolled in the last two months off the Red Files. <laughs> does, does everybody here know what the Red Files are? No. No. Okay. When we had to close the roll, when we sent the last paperwork in for the re-recognition process, uh, there were a number of people that had applied and their, and their files were, paperwork were in Red Files. And unfortunately, they call, we're still they call, working on those. They called them red tagged files, right? Oh, okay. I've never heard that. All I've ever heard is red files. But yeah. evidently, the people have married and moved and stuff like that, including some of my family. So we're, we've been having a really hard time contacting these people. But slowly but surely, we are getting through these red files. And um, we applied for another ANA grant in July of 82. Um, and I have a letter from Phyllis in August of 82 saying that we 
were awarded the grant in the amount of $19,000. Um, and so that was to help, um, I believe both um, Bob Goff and John Turchineski do some further research um, to uh, support the petition. Um, I, uh, at this, in, in early um, 83, I was, uh, wrote a letter to June that I was getting spread too thin, um, serving as newsletter editor, councilman, grant writer, and history committee member, and I told her I wanted to focus just on being the newsletter editor, and that I intended on resigning as the council member in 1983. And one of my uh, frustrations was the lack of interest of Fond du Lac Brothertons. Uh, the meet had been moved to, uh, from Gresham to uh, Fond du Lac because there were so many more Brothertons uh, in the Fond du Lac area. And my frustration was that they weren't participating, they weren't attending meetings, they weren't um, doing uh, things to help in the the way that I, I felt that they, they should be. So that was one of my personal frustrations. And, um, and here I have I the letter. Right back, people. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, and here's, I, I got a letter in uh, January of 83 where Lonnie says that she saw the tribe's uh, exhibit at the Milwaukee Public Museum. And she said, some people were looking at me quite curiously while I was taking pictures of the exhibit. But then a few of them came over to look at what I was taking photos of. And so I said, ha ha, I guess I did some good for the Brother to Nation at that. Uh, um, also uh, in February, I um, had some concerns about how um, the history committee was operating, and so I had um, sent some suggestions to uh, June on how things might um, uh, be improved. Also, um, in July, I sent a letter to her about making suggestions on things that could be done to increase the participation of Fond du Lac Brothertons. And, um, one of the main suggestions was um, that June should get out among the people. She should call them, um, stop by their houses, drop off uh, material. I mean, we had the proclamations from the 150th anniversary. Uh, we had, you know, a one page brochure that described what we were doing. Um, and um, so I, I really stressed that I thought it was important for her to do that. and. In a follow-up letter um, I, I got from June saying she had started that and her reception had been very good. Um, she was very pleased with that. Um, so um, I was glad that she was um, taking action um, to try and do that. Um, All right, I'm, back. I'm sorry? I said I'm back. I had to leave for a few minutes. Oh, I just read your, um, the letter I got from you uh, seeing the um, uh, exhibit at the Milwaukee uh, Public Museum. Oh. And, and how you were saying you were taking photos of it and folks came by and to take a look at what you were photo photographing and so you actually got them interested in the Brotherton. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and then I think, I'm sorry? I was, I was going to ask a question. Um, sure. When you were first starting out with the tribe and it's, it's, um, it was uh, working toward kind of reorganizing a little better, did you personally, do you remember having a sense more of a focus on organizing the Brotherton people more effectively? or a focus more of educating the outside communities on what the Brotherton were doing and who they were? It was really focused on Brothertons. Okay. And I think doing research, especially up at the courthouse at Shelton, 
we had to kind of uh, let the people know that we weren't trying to take their land away that they their ancestors had for the last 150 years because that was their first question it was like well if you get federal recognition what are you going to do take our lands you know and we had to explain to them that that wasn't our goal we wanted to be federally recognized because we consider ourselves an Indian entity. All right. And around this time, we were working on um, another ANA grant, and um, we were looking at trying to restructure it. There were some things that we were looking at um, changing how the history uh, committee functioned. We also were interested in getting the tribal archives out of a private household and into a uh, place where they could be accessed all the time. So part of that was um, um, having a Fond du Lac office. So um, that was a, a real goal of the new ANA grant. And then also to hire um, uh, Brotherton Indians as research paraprofessionals. Um, so, um, rather than relying on historians or anthropologists, we felt we had enough trained Brothertons in historical research that, um, and archive management that we could go ahead and hire them as paraprofessionals in, for the next stage of the petition. And so, um, I know Lonnie, you were involved with some of that, um, and you were the one that had uh, suggested uh, paraprofessional as the, the role that we would be utilizing in that grant and um, it was um, who Renona Elson was hired and um, Vivian Haas was hired and then there was also uh, Renona's daughter-in-law that was hired as a um, office manager um, so I don't know if you remember Seth what your Grandmother's daughter-in-law's name was, but I, I can't. Lani, do you remember what her name was? Oh, I don't. I'm always thinking Renona was the office manager, but you're right. And I don't remember. I think it was Jane. Jane. Yeah, Jane. Yep, that sounds no, right. No, I don't. No, I not I wasn't uh, working yeah. with them at that time. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Did you hear me? I, I was not working with the council at that time. We, we hear that. Okay. I, I think it's a different Jane, isn't it? I think so too. Yeah, I think that's the confusion. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we did, we did get that grant. We were able to um, open up the Petition Coordination Center in Fond du Lac and, as I mentioned, um, hire those, those folks. Um, and I believe these grants were a year at a time, but I believe we got at least two or three in a row so that Petition Coordination Center was open for at least that length of time. Do you remember, yeah. Lonnie? Yeah, I think so too. I think you're right, Mark. Okay. Um, and I have here the grant employees started the week of November 3rd, 1984. <laughs> and also Jack Campisi was contracted to do some work under the new ANA grant. Um, I have in 1988, I have a little bit of a gap here between 1985 and um, 88, but um, I have that the amended bylaws were sent out to tribal members on January 24th, 1988, and that comments must be sent to the council by their March 19th, 1988 meeting. And as of January 11th, 1988, 1,363 members have met enrollment requirements and are listed on the rolls. And they were um, still holding meetings uh, up in Gresham in the summer. And there, one in 1988 was scheduled for August 20th. Um, uh, I don't know, um, in 1988 also, um, Phyllis Frederick um, 
decided to run against June Easel for chair. Um, and there was some sort of mix up as far as absentee ballots. Um, so the, the period for submitting them back was extended. And um, uh, so there was, do you remember this at all, Lonnie? Vaguely. 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 Yeah. yeah. Anyways, um, June was uh, victorious. And so uh, also at this time, uh, Orbis came. There was Orbis Report, which um, was like a, a outside consulting firm that um, evaluates ANA grantees. Uh, and so they came and took a look at what we were doing and sent a report back. And so it was a very good report. Um, um, also, at this time, we had started working with um, the Native American Rights Fund again. They had been involved with us earlier on. Uh, our Linda Locklear had started their work with us several years before, but she had moved on. And so now we were de dealing with Faith Russell. Um, and they were taking a look at litigation and whether or not there was some sort of court case that we could be pursuing. Um, and so they were looking at the 1839 Citizenship Act, um, the court case Fowler versus Scott, and then also Lot 9. I don't know, Lonnie, if you remember Lot 9, but that was the one where the feed mill was. And there yeah. was some question as to whether that had actually gone out of Brotherton hands. Yep. Um, so there was a lot of title research that was done on that. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, um, and this was uh, about end of uh, 1989, beginning of 1990, I know Jack Campisi and um, uh, Faith Russell made a presentation to the Tribal Council saying they did a lot of research and they reported on all the stuff that they did, but they weren't really recommending. They didn't think there was a case for litigation. So, Correct. and they also, they also um, said that the 1839 Act could well be looked at by the federal government as an act of termination. And so if that's the case, they wouldn't even look at a federal acknowledgement petition. So that, would leave the only option of pursuing um, uh, restoration legislation. Um, so I think that came as a, a, a big shock and um, but from what I understand is that the council you know thanked them and decided well you know we don't have their funding we don't have the resources to pursue um, restoration legislation. So we're gonna continue uh, with the federal acknowledgement route and hopefully um, that will be um, accepted. And I any... think the, prob the problem Go was that, that we were the understanding that having been told once that our petition wasn't good enough, we needed more documentation, that they were still looking at us as though we could be possibly federally re-recognized. Nice. Right, and then they asked for additional material numerous times. Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and, and we kept trying to comply with that. Right. Over and over and over. You know, every time they asked us for what we need from this decade to that decade, we kept looking and we kept sending. And so we were always of the feeling and the understanding that they were still looking at us as a, a tribe that could possibly be federally re-recognized. Right. And so we continued to do that additional research. We did, you know, enrollment was opened up, I believe, um, in October of 1989. So more people were added to the roles. Um, so that process continued, I believe, until 1996, which is when the federal acknowledgement petition was 
formally sent in. Yes. Um, and then it took about 17 years for them to come up with a decision, uh, which was no. Yeah. So you mentioned they opened the rolls back up. They had been closed then? When was it that they had closed initially? Yeah, when we when we would send in the materials to for the federal acknowledgement, then we had to close the rolls. We couldn't we could could not enroll people while we were going through the process. So I think Mark, you just said that they were open in October of eighty nine. So when was the paperwork first submitted? When when did the red tagged files become red tagged files instead of just people becoming on the rolls? Then there were rolls yeah. and and then they were closed, and then there were red tag files. I believe in 1996, the second time we sent in the paperwork to the additional paperwork to the federal acknowledgement. Anyways, um, I can't give you a definitive answer on when they were open and when they were closed. I just have the letter from June which says they're going to be reopened on October 1st, 1989. So they were reopened for a period of time and then they were closed again in 1996 when the petition was uh, sent in. So, so that's, that's what I've got. Do you have um, questions, anybody, for either Lonnie or me? Or Lonnie, do you have more you would like to say? No, I think you've been very organized, Mark. I think you've pretty much covered all the bases. Uh, Mark, I didn't hear, where are you now living? I'm in Oakland, California. <laughs> okay. And one of the greatest things you did, you did the uh, Calumet Cross, did you not? The no. silver one, the pattern? No, no, that was Rudy Ottery. Oh, oh I thought that was uh, something that you had started. Okay. No, I started the newsletter. Okay. And we have uh, well, three. Of, we have three of the four news, newsletter editors right here. Right here. <laughs> Seth and, and Megan and me. We're only miss, missing Tim Vanderhoff. Well, there was uh, Doug Foy and um, Mary. Can't remember her name. Did it just before Tim and I was working with Doug Foy at the time too, along with um, the person who was our uh, what would I call him, the manager down at the office at that time. Um, I just don't recall his name any longer, but we did it for several years. It wasn't Dennis Bramins, was it? Pardon? I said it wasn't Dennis Bramins, was it? No, no. no. I know he had been in. Well, this person that uh, we were able to get with one of the grants as oh. the uh, office manager. Do you recall his name? I, I have all of my records in the basement file drawers, so I haven't looked at them for years. No, I don't. But this is It's been very interesting. Do you have one planned for another time? This is my letters that I referenced today for the 1980s. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's cool. <laughs> Again, so many of my tribal materials I donated to the tribe three years ago, so I didn't have a whole lot to look back at. <laughs> I'm just wondering how many of the ones that are on, on this uh, Zoom session right now, how many of you grew up knowing that you were Brotherton Indian? I, I did not. Yeah. I would have to say that I, I knew at some point, maybe when I was 12 or 13, my grandmother mentioned something about it to me. So I knew, but it was not hardly ever talked about. It. Mark? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know. there, was, there was some confusion about being part of the Six Nations Confederacy. Uh, and that had to deal with the whole log affair. I don't know if folks are familiar with that. 
but it was a movement in the 1920s, 30s, maybe up until the 40s, where um, they were pursuing a land claim in um, New York, and it was being headed up by Laura Cornelius Kellogg and her husband, Oren. And so there were these Six Nations clubs that were organized among various tribes, the Oneidas, the Stockbridge, and the Brotherton, and they had monthly dues that you had to pay. They came and collected monthly dues and um, to be part of that um, Six Nations Club and to be you know, eligible to receive any um, payouts from the success of that lawsuit. But obviously that lawsuit never uh, materialized and a lot of Brothertons lost all of their savings and one story I remember June telling me um, was that she can remember where um, Warren Kellogg would show up in his white Oldsmobile and drive onto the family farm north of Fond du Lac or near Fond du Lac. I don't know if it was north or south. But, um, and so her mother would have to go and get the egg money and give it to him uh, to make that month's payment. Well, the reason I ask is because I started doing my family history in 1980, and I had no idea that I was Brotherton Indian. It was never talked about in my family, and I had three great aunts left at the time when I started this. And my oldest great aunt swore up and down. She didn't know nothing about nothing, had there anything to do with Indian. And then after she died, her son called me and said, when's the next time you're coming up in the Unity area? And I told him, and he said, good, you have to come over here by us because I found all these Kellogg papers from my mother that were buried in a box in her closet. So they knew, the older generation, I think, knew that they were they were Brotherton Indian, but it, it just seemed to me like it was in that age where if, if you told anybody you were Indian, you didn't get the better housing or you didn't get the better job or, you know, so... They just didn't talk about it. And I had one cousin that was in his probably 50s at the time. He came up and he was very irate at me at a reunion saying, I don't I don't like this Indian stuff. I don't care about this. I don't want to have nothing about it. And then five years later, he was handing me a check for $500 and told me he was really sorry. And all of his kids and grandkids are now enrolled. So, but it, it was a real learning experience for my family because I had to explain the whole Shelley Johnson background to them because they had no idea. So, and that's why I think I started out as being part of the history committee with Phil and Chris Towsey and then later on being the research paraprofessional at, at the office that would take all the materials in from the other researchers and, and put them in the criteria that they belonged in. And, you know, and, and I knew more and more about my family. And I'm still here, it's 38 years later, and I'm still getting people on Ancestry.com coming out of the woodwork saying, hi, I'm your cousin, and telling me a whole big story. And I, and I, and I never even knew about them. So mm -hmm. it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, Mark and Lonnie, I'd like to thank you both for doing this talk tonight. Also, for all the work that you've done for our tribe over all these years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.